Hello, everyone, and welcome to the BFI Film Academy's December Lab. My name is Alex, and I'm the Film Academy Festival and Events Manager. And today, we'll teach you everything you need to know about presenting yourself and also your work professionally, both online and also in person. The session today will be hosted by Nicole Davis, who is a producer, a writer, and a podcaster, and who works as the BFI Network Officer uh, for Film Hub Southeast. But just before I hand over to Nicole, I just wanted to let, tell you a little bit about how the session today will run. So my colleague Jen is managing the chat box. Please feel free to say hi. And if you have any questions that are more kind of generic questions about the BFI, about Film Academy, our lab series or future film festival, then please put those questions in the chat box and Jen will be answering them um, throughout the session. But please make sure that you select all panelists and attendees uh, when you are um, uh, sharing your questions with us, uh, just because then everyone can see your question and the answer to it. I think that Zoom has it um, set um, by default to just all panelists. So do make sure that that's um, changed. If you do decide to use the chat box, please be respectful to our guests today and please also be respectful towards each other. Uh, please don't use offensive language and please don't use any personal information um, um, either in the chat box. For those of you who've missed it, we shared our code of conduct in the ticketing email um, that was sent to you. If you would like to network with each other, we've set up a networking group on Facebook just for that. So my colleague Jen will share um, that um, the link to that Facebook networking group in the chat box shortly. Um, so feel free to join that group and to um, you know, potentially find collaborators for, for your project, uh, but talk to each other on there. Um, however, if you have any questions for our panelists today, or for Nicole, then please pop those questions in the Q&A box, which is on the bottom of your screens. So my colleague Diana will be managing that box and um, you can start popping those questions in there immediately and we'll devote the last 15 minutes of the session to answering them. Um, and the final thing for me is just to let you know that the session today is being recorded and the recording will be uploaded to the BFI YouTube channel later on this week. So if you miss anything today or if you just wanna watch the session again, you will be able to. And now, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Nicole um, to lead the discussion. Welcome, Nicole. Hi, Alex. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this BFI Film Academy Lab on presenting yourself as a screen creative. I'm Nicole Davis. I'm hosting tonight's session. In order to present myself to you as a screen creative, I try to remove uh, all the potentially embarrassing items from my Zoom background. Um, I'm really thrilled to be joined by three esteemed guests in the form of Ahmed Swade, Head of Content at Dazed Media and Nowness. Hi everyone, hi Nicole. Hi Ahmed, thank you. Uh, Nathan Bryan, an actor, writer and producer. Hello. Hi Nathan. And Yen Yao, Director of Training Programs at the Grierson Trust and Board Trustee at CMI. Hello everybody. <coughs> Hello Yen. Hello to hi. you all. Thank you for spending your Monday evening with me. Um, I want to start off by asking a couple of general questions to the group, just to kind of define the parameters of today's session. The creative industries are, you know, thankfully not as dull as some corporate environments, which seem a little bit devoid of personality. But then I'm wondering what professionalism means in this context, you know, how can someone give off this vibe of credibility and employability while also being themselves? Ahmed, would you like to get the ball rolling for us? Um, sure, yeah, I think when it comes to, you know, being professional, I think the way that I look at it, and especially in the environment that I work in, which is um, a magazine that's really catered to youth primarily, um, the main thing is really just to be yourself is, is the most important thing that I can say. I think at times, you know, it's important to also remember that anyone who has got their foot in through the door has, has been in that position before starting off. So just being yourself and being open is, is is what I always say and how I try to express that myself. Absolutely. Yeah, and do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I'm looking for passion, you know, it's about <clears throat> if you wanna be working in uh, whichever bit of the creative industries that you're seeking to explore. Some of us or some young people will know very early on what they're interested in, some don't. I always describe it, imagine being in a sweet shop, try everything, but you know, be authentic, certainly be authentic and um, show me your passion. So if you wanna be a director, 
you know, if you haven't picked up a camera or directed, go off and watch films and talk about the directors. If you want to edit, go off and edit. Just don't be that wannabe because then it's really thinking, OK, um, how can I help you? I just don't know where, where your interests lie. So, so give me something to work with and then I know where I can best help you, basically. And Nathan, what does that word professionalism mean to you? Oh man, professionalism is scary even to me as a professional. But um, I, I, think, I think it is important as well as part of being a professional. And when I meet young creatives, I get really excited by someone who's already thinking a million miles ahead. Even if you haven't picked up that first camera, obviously go do that. But it's really good to hear like speaking to someone being like, look, I know one day I want to direct a Hollywood movie that's of this genre and it's a bit like this. Because I think it's really good if you've got that sort of, you know, end sort of goal in your mind, because then you know where you're going. It's fine if you don't. And the journeys, as my career has been, is discovering lots of different bits. But it's really exciting if you've kind of got a place where you can see where you want to be and then you can manifest your way to get there. Do you know what I mean? Mm, absolutely. And then in terms of being a screen creative, which is a bit of a vague term, I'm wondering if you can kind of offer some idea of what roles, like the advice that we're going to be talking about today will apply to. Ahmed, I'll come back to you to start off with. Um, in terms of roles, I mean, you know, fr from my side, I would say, again, um, the platforms that I work for, they, they differ quite a bit. So I, I usually work in the domain of content, which can mean so many different things but that can be anything from a video commissioner to a social editor to a video editor themselves. So, you know, I, and I think the key thing, and I think, you know, what Yen was saying before about passion is really, really important and experimenting within that as well. Even if you don't have all of that already within your portfolio, as long as you have something and you're trying stuff out is the key thing. Mm. And then, Yen, you know, in the context of the training programs that you run at Grace and Trust, which are obviously around factual content, what yeah. are some of the careers that people that have gone through those programs go on to do? Um, so we mostly work and prepare people for, um, for careers within um, factual television documentaries, but we have some young people who have actually wanted to um, <clears throat> go down the independent route or go down um, branded content, you know, whether it's with Dazed or whether it's going to be with Vice. Um, so it's a it's a variety and it goes back to they don't you know you, young people here in on the call today they don't necessarily know what they know they don't know what they don't know and it's really great that they're here tonight with us because it's about exploring that career um, that curiosity because you know unless they go off and find out a bit about things from wide source from wide sources and, and getting access to people to hear those um, different stories and uh, entry points in because in our sector it's not like becoming an accountant says right I go away to do the degree I go away and do the professional exams and wham bam I'm an accountant in our sector the creative industry there's so many different ways in and there's so many different jobs and I remember somebody once telling me it's like um if you're making a film um, it's like building a house. You've got all these different jobs and there's all these different roles that you, you can probably find something that's going to suit you. So although we talk a lot about creatives and content producers, I think there's also um, we lack sometimes the wherewithal to also um, tell young people that there's um, production management roles as well, because we have a huge skill shortage because, you know, it's great. We have the directors and the editors coming up with a vision, but we actually need a team of people around them to help the vision to actually, um, you know, bring that to fruition because you know, everybody is up there working um, to support the director with their vision, whether it's going to be branded content, whether it's going to be a factual film, whether it's going to be scripted. It's everybody coming together as a team. And I think at the moment we don't have that balance where everybody actually knows what all those full jobs are because they're all looking at the shiny stuff, which seems to be about production and thinking they're going to be on on location or on set. So um, I think, you know, as we're talking and going through the, the this evening, it'll be really good for us to explore some of those things for young people. Yeah, exactly. And understanding that they have creative capacities in those kind of behind the scenes roles as well. Yeah, yeah. because I think sometimes we get too het up and thinking about um, not thinking about um, creative roles being the creative, but actually as a production manager, you still have to use problem solving skill, skills, which is another word for um, being a creative, but we don't actually frame it in that way. So sometimes you just think, oh, well, that's the only way I'm going to be express my creativity. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, these guys will know it isn't, that isn't the, that isn't the, um, the case at all. You know, if you're a director or if you're a production manager, you're still using those same skills just in a different way. Absolutely, that's a really good point. And then Nathan, you're an actor, writer and producer. Did it take you a while to kind of realise that you could do it all? <laughs> uh, um, 
Well, I think they're all the same, weirdly, right? I think once you become a creator, you just work out that you have to hustle. The hustle is the thing. So I only produce when I had to produce because no one else wanted to produce my stuff. <laughs> and then I was acting because I wanted to. So then I was writing because I wanted roles. So, you know, and then now it's become more of a thing of like, well, now I can, you know, assistant produce some of my films or TV shows or whatever it is. But I think it's initially when I first started, it was just needs must. No one else cares about my story more than me. So let me push all my work. And if I have to write the theme tune, sing the theme tune, all of everything, then that's what we're going to do. Do you know what I mean? And I feel sorry for all you lot listening to the theme tune. <laughs> No, I love that. Yeah, you have to kind of, yeah, the malleability of, of that, yeah. I think, is really key. Um, so I've broken down today's session into kind of like the key areas in which you might be asked to present yourself as a screen creative, the first of which is pitch decks. Um, I don't think I knew what these were for like the first four or five years of my career. So I'm going to start off with a stupid question. What is a pitch deck and what purpose does it serve? Yen, can I ask you to kick this off for us? Yeah, so a pitch deck is basically a, like a fancy name for a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation. What it is, is distilling into one document for somebody that you're going to be talking to what your idea is. So um, if I use the example of the Grist and Doc Lab and my trainees recently, I set up um, several panels for them to pitch their ideas to commissioning editors, execs um, from people like, um, was it Channel 5 commissioning editor to a BBC Studios um, exec talking about their ideas. And I said to them, you have three minutes, um, you've, you've got this opportunity to talk uh, with passion, this idea that you want to actually um, see made. And that's that's what it was. Um, but I think one of the things that, um, you know, I always say to them is that less is more. Don't, you know, it's like when you're doing a presentation in, in person, you don't want to be reading off the screen. They, they're, they're like basically prompts. And what you're looking for is what the tone is, who your audience is. It's just, it's just to help you get your words out in, in a way that's structured, basically. Mm almost like digital flashcards like you're giving yeah yourself. yeah yeah that's a good way of putting it basically yeah and I think it's something that you pull out if you need because you know I always think about the elevator pitch and um you know you don't know who you're going to meet these guys you know when when we're going to be going out in the real world again and we're going to be bumping into strangers you know if somebody asks you what what you're interested in what you want to do if you can just say well let me show you it's something that you can just use to help you um articulate in a, in a simple way what you're after I think that's just some it's just something very useful to have and Ahmed, coming from your perspective, in what context would someone need a pitch deck? You know, is it something that people should always have up their sleeve or just something that you should create when you're asked for one? Well, I think it's always good to have to have that with you. Um, but primarily for, for, uh, from my experience, the pitch deck that I'm always looking at is their Instagram profile as well. So I think that's something always to keep in mind as well, because the first thing that someone's going to look at is your social media uh, profile, primarily your Instagram or your Twitter, I should say. Mm. Yeah, no, well, definitely. We've, we're gonna devote a big chunk to social media because I think it's one of those things that it's quite blurry. It's yeah. hard to know how, because it's a personal platform, but then, yeah, as you say, as a creative, we have started to use it much more professionally. Um, Nathan, coming to you as a filmmaker, when you're pitching an idea for a short film or a show, what does that actually look like? You know, like what are you putting in that deck to tell prospective commissioners or producers about the story and about yourself and the vision? Generally, like, like I'm dyslexic, so I really struggle with um, those sort of pitch deck documents. And generally, when you sell an idea to a company, they help you build those documents together. But initially, when you're starting off in your career, you're often making those documents yourself. And the best ones I've ever, ever worked on um, like Yen said, are short. You want something really quick. Someone's going to be having a tea or on the loo, scrolling on their phone, reading this, and they're going to want to know what that idea is, why should they be excited, and what makes it different from all the other stuff out there. So generally, my general feeling when I do them at the moment is I want whoever's read this to leave and be excited, and I want them to ask questions. So if you write a pitch doc and you feel it with every single thing that you've ever thought about the idea and it's 20 pages they're going to get to the end and be like look I'm glad I got to the end but I ain't got no damn questions I'm done um and I've done that I've written a, a, my first pitch doc was 41 pages this poor producer um but he did buy it he did buy it thank god but um I don't recommend that so yeah passion they just want to see that 
you're someone who's really excited about this because that means they can sell that excitement to a channel or a movie producer or whatever. So that's why I would focus on it. A bit of a like logistical question, like in what format are you making this? You know, is it a PDF? Is it a Word doc? Like, I mean, for that people is a good that... question because like, again, I'm very uh, technology, it's not my thing. It's not, it's not really, I'm like, anyway. So at first it was just really dry Microsoft Word docs. And you, to be honest, producers don't care. Like if it's a one page doc and it's written really well and they're getting across all the simple points of what it's about, who are the main characters and why it's different from anything else that's out there. I mean, they don't care if it's on a one page. If you've got really great, uh, you know, technology chops, I get my, you know, producers and I often drag my girlfriend in to make um, fancy, what's it, Adobe or something where you, drag the images around and <laughs> fancy word art and so she hates me for that but that looks good but if the idea doesn't do what its job is they don't care how it looks so I wouldn't necessarily worry about format really but I could be wrong I, I'm just saying from my experience yeah. Sorry, yeah, for, for, certainly for factual because um uh, what we what I what I say is that if you've got access because you know there's how many news stories are there there's not that many but what you have is the people that you can gain access to in those those stories so if you've got compelling characters and contributors that's your golden ticket it's your currency basically the idea is great but then it's about the execution you can show that well actually this idea is um, can be um, um, can be demonstrated through this person who's got a fantastic story and I have access to this person so that's your entree to those companies because they 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 may have had that idea but they didn't have that person where that could be that who was the anchor for that story so that's what gets you through the door and that may lead to something may not but at least it starts that conversation with people so certainly for factual that's what you, you should be incorporating that um within your pitch doc and it would be a pdf and it's some images and as i said earlier not too much text because then it's about conversations and you showing your passion but if you're reading it off the screen that doesn't convey as much as you know speaking from the heart and just off the cuff yeah I would echo that actually when I was 19 I cold emailed a producer with a script that was it was honestly it was terrible but I made a really professional looking pitch deck and they said that they'd read it off the back of the the look of this pitch deck I mean they, they never called me back after the email after reading <laughs> the script even but they, they looked at it apparently no but you know the story about um everybody's talking about Jamie I actually met him because it opened um the Edinburgh Film Festival I'm a, I'm a board member of the Edinburgh Film Festival and I was talking to his mother in the reception afterwards and says how did he how did he you know, how was the BBC documentary made about him? He was doing media studies as a GCSE. And he, he what he did was literally as a 16 year old, a 15 year old wrote to lots of production companies with this idea. You know, it was him who put himself out there and his story was unique. And that's what got him over the line. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, that's that's thinking about pitching ideas. Then when it, when it comes to like pitching yourself and putting together a portfolio, what do you put in a portfolio or a CV or a cover letter when you're literally first starting out and you probably have little or no relevant experience? Ahmed, I'll come back to you if we can and kick that off with you. Sure, you actually just made me think about like how I kind of started out a bit. And essentially um, what I did, um, I actually wasn't even living in the UK. I was living abroad. Um, I was living in Sierra Leone where I'm partially from. And I remember there were all these magazines I had wanted to work for. And I literally just came up with stuff and put stuff in. I just came up with stuff that I had wanted to do. And because um, I didn't really have any of that experience. But I think what had helped me at that point was that the passion that I had had and the motivation and ambition where it was kind of like <laughs> just emailing everyone that I, I, well, that I had everywhere that I had wanted to work. And that led me to a few internships that got my foot through the door. So, I mean, from my own experience, you know, again, it was just trying to come up with whatever it is that I wanted to do, but being very passionate about the delivery in terms of, you know, like, I'm not backing down. This is something I really want to, um, to do. Mm -mm. And Nathan, what about for you when you like, might not have any credits, but you're sort of trying to get yourself in a certain realm or arena? How do you say like, yeah, I can do this? Oh, it's really funny. I mean, I think when we first started making sketches, well, basically, I think when you first are trying to put yourself out there, so if you're trying to email a TV producer or a movie producer or documentary producer, you do need something. So whether that be 
a, a pitch idea that you want to share, or it's a TikTok that's really funny that you've made, they're going to want to see a little bit of something. And that's what we did to get our start. We used to make um, YouTube sketches and we were just really audacious. And we just thought the head of Warner Brothers has to see this YouTube sketch. Fact, he has to see it. He's going to put, a, put Batman 2 to the side and see it. So we'd guess his email. We'd go on some of these websites where you can guess people's email. And we'd just sling an email to the head of Warner Brothers. Who'd ignore us? <laughs> <laughs> Rightly so. But... Um, I think what you do after you send out some stupid audacious ones, uh, you start being a bit more practical and you work out TV producers who you really want to see your work because they've made a show that you really like. So basically the, the first thing is the, you want to get a nice calling card, whether that be a, tr uh, a treatment doc or a sketch, like I said. Um, but always, I always will say, I know I made that joke about emailing um, the head of Warner Brothers on a whim. Uh, but so me and my best friend were in a comedy um, sketch show and we did do that and he was ignored at first and then afterwards he followed the head of Warner Brothers up with another email and he became his mentor so it does there are gaps in the system um, and it's not about being you know not being able to read the room read the room <laughs> but do you know what I mean be audacious and have something to share is my rambling uh, message <laughs> Mm, no, but I'm really glad you raised like TikTok because I do think it is about just utilizing like the materials or the resources that you have at your disposable and like not thinking that it has to be like super professional. Like it's about just putting something out there that, if, yeah, says like this is who I am. Like it doesn't have to be the best now, in the world. Even the opposite. It's like if now people don't want to see some super slick blah, blah, blah to show a seed of an idea is funny. Like if you look at some of these TikTok comedians that I've literally spent, I mean, I'm 30 years old. I'm on TikTok every day. Um, <laughs> like just scrolling at these people, cracking me up. And it's them pointing the camera at themselves being funny. Or them talking to somebody on the street and they're sharing this really human moment about things in life they've regretted or fashion. Like you can do it on your phone without anything. And that's exciting. Mm -mm -mm. And then, yeah, coming to you, like you mentioned that passion was like really important for you for people to kind of um, sh showcase their kind of skills. But I'm wondering when you're, you know, you're putting together a portfolio or a cover letter, how would you advise people to kind of prioritize or, or frame their skills and expertise? You know, you might not want to list every single module that you've taken at university or yeah. every single film that you see and every single yeah. director that you love. So how, how are people um, best advised to be selective? Yeah, so uh, you're all new entrants. Please keep it to one page. We don't need essays. Um, I think what you need to be thinking about is that to work in the screen industries, you don't need a media or film degree. That you know, please, please, please realise that university is not the only route. And what people are basically seeking are soft skills. I want to know that if I'm, you know, Ahmed or you know Nathan, whoever they're going to be working with, they want to know that they're going to be reliable. They're going to take turn up on time. They're going to be, you know, a good team player. They're going to be showing some initiative. They're going to have a can-do attitude. Those are the things that you want to convey in your application or your CV. Not the fact that you know you've got a media degree and you've got a first. You know, you can be as creative and technical as you can be, and that's brilliant. But if you can't get on with people, and we are an industry which is very social and very, very dynamic, if you can't convey those skills, you're not going to get very far. So just think about, as Nathan says, you know, stuff that you've gone out and done. You know, it's not going to be perfect, but that's okay. It's like saying, well, I'm going to bake a cake. Your first cake, you know, you don't get the ingredients right, it might not rise, but at least you're showing me that you're going to have a go. And that's really just as important because you put that in your covering letter because you're talking about having a go. Um, you want to be showing about what you might have done extracurricularly, what you've done with your friends, um, you know, films that you've watched, you know, the soft skills that anybody will have, just turning up on time, um, you know, doing a project at school. There's loads of different things, but it's about um, talking to other people who can help you visualise and actually pick those out because sometimes you're just too close to it and you can't see that at all. Mm -hmm. And actually, when I talk to young people and we have these conversations and starting picking and asking them those questions, they quickly realise that they do have those skills. They have the skills that Nathan and Ahmed will be looking for, as well as me, in collaborators. But um, sometimes you just you just can't see it because you just think, oh, my God, I've got to make stuff. I've got to make stuff. And it has to be perfect. And that isn't the case at all. Mm -mm. I think it's also I couldn't just agree with you more. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say I couldn't agree with you more on that because... Many a times I'll find, you know, 
especially within, uh, I'll have a lot of applicants for people who really want to work in social media, which is fantastic, but I won't hire someone just if they're just a social media whiz, so to speak. Again, it is those soft skills that matter and it is having those um, social skills, but also enthusiasm to learn and want to learn. And I, I, that, I couldn't, you know, that's so, so important. Couldn't agree more. Well, speaking of social skills, I think networking is a really obviously big part of this industry. It's also a really daunting part of this industry just because it's quite notoriously difficult to do, especially like for new entrants. If like they've only been on Zooms kind of doing these kind of things, then suddenly maybe being in a big room with people that they don't know, like trying to approach them and ask them about, you know, how to how to progress in this industry. Yeah. And starting with you, you know, how would you advise people to make make networking work for them, you know, or to feel better prepared or or confident? In, in these kind of contexts yeah I think I think it can look it can feel very very scary and I think that that you've got nothing to lose you know if you reach out to people what's the worst that can happen right you have to ask yourself that and the worst that can happen is that they don't respond you know it's as simple as that so um be brave and uh, identify people or production companies or um people that you admire and just reach out to them and if they they respond that's fantastic and if they don't uh, try again, but don't stalk them. Uh, you know, have have a, have a go, um, and and um, you know, just be brave. Just be brave about it. And when we come into the real world and we start networking and going to festivals and doing things, I think the tip that I always say is um, give yourself an achievable low goal. If you walk into a room and it can be really overwhelming because you've got so many people, all you want to do is say, actually, for me. Success looks like just talking to three people, three strangers. I'm really shy, but actually, if I've talked to three people, once you've achieved that, anything more is going to be a bonus. So maybe just one person, but give yourself something that's achievable rather than looking to, to a room and seeing just a sea of faces and just being paralyzed by that. Mm -hmm. We will come back to the art of the email because, again, that's quite difficult to master and, and knowing kind of when to follow up. Um, but Nathan, you're an actor, obviously, among many other things, which is a profession that can sometimes be about who you know. You know, how do you handle situations or conversations where you're essentially trying to further your career, but without coming across as, you know, like overly keen or like you're pestering someone? Do you know what? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great question. I think... I don't think overly keen, I don't think you ever have to worry about that. I always just think that, um, well, maybe I've never quite worried about it because I'm just like, well, I really believe in creating my own work. So mm -hmm. I find that in these sort of networks, I think once you know that you are the creator of your greatest work, you are going to be the person who's going to generate the work for yourself, then you don't have to worry in those networks, net networking situations so much because you can go, well, from this conversation this doesn't right my career doesn't ride and die on this conversation if this person says no to me i am still going to be able to be an actor nothing takes me nothing can take uh no one can take me being an artist away from me and i think that's really nice to know that when i go into those rooms it's actually about meeting my fellow creative and most importantly in networking in rooms and it probably quite obvious but I find it really good in networking situations to listen to other people as much as possible my job is to at the end of a networking event know way more about everybody else I want to know who's doing what and everything I can and of course talk about yourself and sell yourself but I want to know about you so we can collaborate together so yeah Mm. yeah that's so key because then if you follow up with them you'll kind of know what they're about or like what they're looking for so you can be more targeted yeah Ahmed, you mentioned like Instagram earlier. I'm interested to know if you have a perspective on whether there are more like productive ways to network than getting in a room and having a chat. You know, how can young people use social media platforms to connect with the right people and even, you know, make their own communities, you know, make their own spaces to network? Um, I couldn't agree with you more on that too. I think when it comes to a platform like Instagram, um, it's also really about finding your niche and what you're interested in and finding like-minded individuals on the platform you know some of some of my closest i mean even friends at this point are people that i met on instagram first uh, that work within the same industry as me and i think it's really about building those relationships as well i think even when we're speaking about networking it's about really connecting with someone and figuring ways to collaborate this industry is all about collaboration so um, I think that's really the key thing. Um, so whether it's a case of just, you know, having a conversation via DM because you like what someone's saying, I think, again, you know, just taking what was being said before about 
having that achievable goal. I think it's the same thing, you know, try it out on Instagram. It's still, you know, I think what I would always also say is that it is called social media for a reason. And sometimes people forget the social element of it and just focus on the media. So being able to use any platform to connect and finding your niche is definitely a way to, um, you know, to network. Mm -mm. I mean, that's a good, neat segue into social media in the main. Like, obviously, you feel it's essential to have some kind of presence. Do you think it's good to have a presence across all channels or should you be like picking and choosing depending on what kind of creative you are and what you have to showcase? Well, I think it. I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, be on every single platform. <laughs> I, I think do use the platform that's right for you that can highlight your skills or whatever you really enjoy using. I think that's the, the way I would approach it. You know, I, I don't think it's about like, okay, well, everyone's on TikTok now, go and make a TikTok. Um, but, you know, for example, if, if, you know, if writing is your thing, then Twitter makes sense. I think, you know, I think there's ways to kind of figure out what works best for you. Um, at the end of the day, you know, people are gonna look for your profile whether it's on Instagram or Twitter. I think those two, I would say, are maybe the, the main ones. You know, TikTok is a plus, um, but definitely Instagram or Twitter is what I would say. And then, yeah, if you, if you enjoy it, that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, is it about posting every day or is it better just to speak when you have, you know, something to say or, or not come on it with any kind of agenda? And again, just kind of being yourself. I, I would say, I mean, for me, it's really about the value that you post. Obviously it's, you know, if, I mean, if you're looking to grow, which is a question I get asked all the time, I mean, it's definitely like post more content, but at the end of the day, it's like post something that has, you know, I'd rather post something that will have more value and reach more people. I'd rather, you know, do that than just posting a lot of content just for the sake of it. Um, I think, you know, it depends in terms of how, what makes sense for you, you know, sometimes, with um but i would also say this i think instagram is like a canvas and every social media platform is a canvas at the end of the day so you can use it whether it's about you sharing whatever you're really passionate about your interests or maybe you know i think um you could you know be more like a portfolio but then also even experimenting with it as well i think you know one thing i always say is that we're still very much in the very early years of social media and there's so much you can experiment um when it comes to all the different platforms mm -mm -mm. and then Nathan bring you in here because obviously part of a big part of filmmaking is sort of like promoting yourself <laughs> so I'm wondering like how you go about either like plucking up the courage to self-promote which can be a bit cringe but then also like not going overboard so that the only thing that's on your social media platforms is like you selling yourself how do you strike that balance yeah it's a really it's a really tough balance because I starting up have been that beggar in everyone's dms being like come to my event please 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 and I've sent thousands of emails that proper nerd like just on it on it on it some people are like wow that's amazing you can do it and some people are like please stop DM me every day. <laughs> so there's definitely a thin line. I mean, so obviously find that line for yourself. Um, I would say in general, my general use of uh, social media, for me, it's just be positive if you can. Actually, that might be fake as well. I might be fake. For me, on my thing, it's like, I, I don't like have my social media locked into my soul. So I'm not one of those people who I'm, I don't know if I should be promoting this, but I don't share my bad days. And that's not something I'm saying you guys should do. Cause I think social media for some is really true and honest. And I love following people who are, it's just that I'm too shook for that. And I'm an ugly crier and I ain't trying to feel and share that with none of you. I'll put that in my script. Um, so for me, my social media is all about me just sharing things I like and, or sharing people's movies I like. and. I'm also really positive about like, I never say anything bad about anyone's work on social media. I think we're all critiques and that's great, but it's so hard to make anything. In my opinion, I just, if I've got nothing nice to say, as my mom says, I ain't gonna say nothing. Um, and then I would also just follow it up with by saying, we're all artists share each other's work. It is like so important. So if your mate's got an Indiegogo campaign, share it. It's nothing, don't, don't worry if you've got no money to put in the pocket, share it so that our film community really grows. But that's just how I do it. And I can, I love my, some of my friends who are 
really uh, emotional social medias or in touch with who they are. They show their highs and their lows. I love it. It's just that I'm not, I'm not strong enough to do that. <laughs> I'm shook. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the, the best way it was put for me, I'm going to paraphrase Michaela Cole here, but she sort of, when she gave her speech and she was like saying about um, not being afraid to be invisible, to like go and create the work, like leaving social media to like go do your thing, be an artist and come back and like not being afraid that you're going to like lose your followers in that time that you spend away from social media. So nice. And then Ahmed and Yen as kind of employers, I'd sort of love to know if you look at people's social media actively when you're like looking to sort of hire them, whether there are any big social media no-nos, you know, what should people absolutely not be doing on social media? Uh, yeah, I suppose, I suppose nowadays it's it, people know that, you know, you shouldn't be showing certain things which will put you in a bad professional light. Um, some people will have two accounts, I suppose. So you have your own personal things and then you'd have a professional account as well. So you might want to be thinking about that. I do look at uh, people's digital footprint. That's why, I, you know, I'm older than you guys. That, that's what I would look at. Do It gives you an indication about what their interests are. And, you know, um, as I said, not that media wannabe because I run... I run training schemes where it's very competitive and I want to know that the people that I'm potentially shortlisting, that they're, they're being true and actually they're all going back to that authenticity. So, you know, is it that they've only been doing it for a week? And I thought, OK, well, this isn't a passion that's been long standing. I've been really struggling to get in because I have limited resources and it's about breaking down barriers for those who find it difficult to get into the industry. Um, you know, then the people that have actually really um, worked at this, they've struggled, they want to get into the industry, what can I do to help them? And you can track that through whom they follow, what they're interested in, questions that they've asked, all of that. So we do, in ter terms of um, applications, we do ask for their social media handles. So we might explore that a bit. Mm -mm. And Ahmed, what about for you? Yeah, I mean, I 100% look at uh, their social media profiles. I think it's important. I think it's, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I think primarily if, 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 the, if the work is really about creating content, for me, it's about seeing what kind of, you know, what they're interested in and what they're passionate in. And I think also what I would say is that, um, and I was mentioning this before, I wouldn't necessarily hire someone just because they're like a whiz at a specific skill. It's really about kind of finding out also like what motivates them and what they're interested in. Um, and I think what I would also say and kind of, um, you know, is, is it's important that the, when you're applying for all, to look at the social media of the company that you're also applying for as well and know the brand, mm. because I can't stress that enough where I've, I've actually met a couple of people who, who wanted to, to work at, you know, for one of the brands, but maybe they weren't as up to date or, I mean, it's not about knowing everything, but just having at least a surface level of what it is you're applying for. And I think that's really important too, especially if the role is on social media or mm -hmm. on in content on YouTube, you know, like know what type of content we're putting out on our YouTube as well. I think that's really important. No, I agree. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, always do your research. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's amazing how many people don't, or you know, you think they want to work in screen industries, and then they don't watch films, or you know, they don't they don't watch any content. So, uh, hello, um, you know, we yeah. are a screen industries. Please do watch the content. Please go to the cinema if you want to be a filmmaker. Um, you know, just don't watch stuff on the small screen. Watch it on all platforms and in different ways because you know that you know that's what we're about, basically. Mm -mm. Sometimes the simplest advice is the truest. Um, yeah, true. Yeah. And then obviously social media is kind of a bit more uh, chatty and, and colloquial and short form. So thinking back to kind of this longer form writing about ourselves, Yen, whether it's kind of an email introducing yourself or like a bio on a website, what kind of tone do you think it's appropriate to strike? You know, again, coming back to how do you present yourself as a person, but also being professional? Yeah, I, 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 I suppose... Um... You don't want to be coming over too chatty. You're trying to be, you know, it's a professional um, impression that you're giving. Unfortunately, people make snap judgments very, very quickly. So if I met you, I would know and I would make a snap judgment with you, about you in, in seconds, basically. And similarly on online, where, um, you know, your profile reading it or something that you're putting out there in terms of social media. So you need to be... Um, not long essays, as Nathan said earlier, not 40 pages long on anything. Just keep it short and, and snappy. Um, be brief, 
and be, you know, that the word that we keep using is about authenticity, but also passionate. So, you know, talk a bit about yourself, what makes you tick, why, why you want, if you're applying to my scheme or any of the schemes, or if I was interviewing for a job, I want to know why do you want to work? Why, what, why do you want to work? Or why do you want to have this opportunity? And why are you the best person for that? Basically, that's, that's, you know, that's what we're trying to distill. And, um, you know, it's not going to be perfect the first time. It's something that you have to work at. And don't be afraid to ask for people for help and ask them, does this sound right? What do you think? Is this too long? You know, sometimes, as I say, too close wood for the trees. And sometimes you just need somebody with an external um, viewpoint just saying, no, it's fine. Or, or saying it's too long or whatever. So, you know, just get a, perhaps a few people, friends, but also older people who, have, who are the, you know, who might be the type that um, hire people to just have a look at um, what you might be writing to help you get that tone right. Mm. If you don't ask, yeah, I was going to say, the last thing I said, if you don't ask, you don't get. And that's the thing I think as a young person, it can be very, very daunting to say, oh, I can't ask that person. Well, you know, what again, going back to it won't hurt. No, nothing bad is going to happen. The worst that can happen is that they ignore you or they're too busy and they can't respond. But you might just get a positive response and something that can be quite um, encouraging from somebody or they may know somebody who can help you. But if you don't ask or you can't get onto their radar, you, you know, it, it's really difficult, basically, because me and guys here in the room on panel we're not mind readers you know we need something from them to help so we can know identify how we can help people mm -hmm. well yeah you kind of raised obviously the email there and I do want to talk about the the art of the cold email because in my experience people rarely reply to emails you know where you're outright saying like do you have any jobs going or like can you hire me but like they will reply to emails, you know, just if you want to go for a coffee or if you say, could you meet up for maybe like a 15 minute Zoom where I could ask some questions or pick your brain. So I'm wondering if any of you have any more advice like that on, you know, how to craft an email that is more likely to receive a reply, mm -hmm. you know, and potentially lead to an opportunity down the road. Ahmed, I'll come to you first. Um, I think the most important thing is know your audience and who is it that you're emailing. I think that's the most important thing because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if you're looking to work for a specific company, you are emailing an individual. So it is really about finding, okay, well, who is this individual? What is it that they do? Um, because again, you know, so I, I get emails and DMs all the time where it's like, okay, well, I want a job at Days, I want a job at Nowness. And I'm like, okay, but <laughs> what's been interesting is sometimes like, you know, I remember one time I there was this kid who basically wanted a a specific role, and what he did was he created this entire Instagram account, like a fake Nowness Instagram account, and sent it to me, which I thought I was like, okay, you know, this guy's you know made a bit of effort, and I, I'll, I'll meet with him. And for me, it was getting my attention, and I kind of already automatically knew what it was he was interested in doing. So. Um, I think that's also the main thing as well. Know your audience. Who is it that you're after? Like, if you're if you're looking to be a video commissioner, well, you know, okay, who who is the person that will be hiring for that role? Do your research. I mean, it's actually really not that hard. I think it's again just putting in the time to do that. You know, to do the hustle. Yeah. Nathan, do you have anything to add to that? Have you ever received an email from someone that you've been like, yeah, I'll, I'll chat to them because they've done something particularly striking? Yeah, yeah. Like, I guess, well, I both, both. So I've sent a million of those emails um, and I've learned...